Um, our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Benjamin. She'll be speaking on management of severe pelvic fractures. Dr. Benjamin is Associate Professor of Clinical Surgery at the Kent School of Medicine, LA County, USC Medical Center in Los Angeles. Uh, she's also very actively involved as a Director of Quality Improvement for both the Division of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at both facilities. So welcome her to the podium, please. Okay, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to get to come out to this beautiful weather uh, this time of year, so thank you so much and get to talk to all of you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about management of severe pelvic fractures, no disclosures. Why is this important? Why, you know, why do we care so much about pelvic fractures? Well, pelvic fractures, even in this 2016, so relatively recent AAST study, Pelvic fracture in hospital mortality, 9%. So one out of basically 10 patients are still dying of pelvic fractures, even with all of these advances that we've been hearing about and we continue to do. When you take a pelvic fracture and a patient in shock, that mortality shoots up to almost a third of all patients are gonna die from that injury. The reason for this is these are really difficult injuries to manage. Uh, you know, a lot of our techniques uh, don't really apply to that area that's very deep down in the pelvis. It can be hard to access with our hands, and, uh, and we don't really have a lot of tools to help us out there. Uh, and these patients bleed a lot. Uh, they bleed a lot, and we get really far behind uh, very easily and very quickly. So. When I think about pelvic fractures, if I have a patient that comes in, bad pelvic fracture, the first thing I really care about are what are their hemodynamics? Are they stable or are they unstable? So just sort of big picture things. If they're stable, um, I, still they can have problems, but uh, the sort of the focus and my algorithm is gonna now be towards definitive management of that pelvic fracture, and uh, it's not usually gonna be exactly at the top of my list of what I need to deal with. The ones that I really worry about are the ones that are unstable, and I need to put them from the unstable pile into the stable pile, and I need to do some something in order to get them there. Uh, so these are the things I was going to talk about today. These are sort of five tools. These are the five sort of main go-to things that I think of uh, when it comes to pelvic fractures and sort of basics of stabilizing, getting patients from that unstable pile into the stable pile. So pelvic binders, first, a whole bunch of different kinds of pelvic binders uh, available on the market. Uh, pretty much they all do the same thing. There's a bunch of studies that look at one versus the other, but basically if applied appropriately, they're all good. At LA County, uh, this is the one we use. This is one of our patients in a binder. Um, ideally, you get that binder around. You know that they have a bad pelvic fracture, preferably an open book fracture, and you, you cinch it down. Most important thing with binders, uh, put it in the right place. You know, binders are not corsets. Uh, they should be placed over the greater trochanters. It's lower than you think, always. So make sure to take a nice skinny patient, especially if you're like straight out of nursing school or medical school, find a nice skinny patient and feel where exactly those greater trochanters are. You feel like you're putting it on their knees, okay, when you first start doing it. Um, extremely important that it's nice and low. This picture I kind of like because you can see it's starting to scoot up higher and higher. This patient has an open abdomen, they're going to pop <laughs> eventually. Um, so really important to place that properly. What does a pelvic binder do for you? Decreases that pelvic volume, okay, and so in a theoretically will help to tamponade the bleeding, okay, but it basically what it does is it takes kind of that open volume of the pelvis and squeezes it down to make it a, a smaller circle, basically. The other thing that it does is it stabilizes the fracture. So it, it allows when, you know, you have those sick trauma patients, right? You're, they're on the gurney, you transfer them to the scanner, you transfer them to the ICU bed, you have to roll them, you clean the sheets, you, all these things, you keep moving the patient around. That binder will help stabilize that pelvis and help it do less shift during all of that. And with all of those transfers, of course, those patients are in a huge amount of pain. Pelvic fractures hurt a lot. Um, and uh, so they, they really help to decrease the pain. So these sound great, right? So should everybody go in a binder? No. <laughs> Don't put everybody in a binder, okay? What do you think is going to happen with this patient if they're put in a binder? Yeah, not, not ideal, right? Potentially this is a, a fracture that could be a really bad fracture, but it's basically in line right now, probably associated with a real amount of bleeding. Put on a binder, you can potentially displace the fracture further. What about this one? Yeah, this patient came in. They were actually quite stable when they came in. Uh, imagine if that patient had a binder. Yeah, not ideal. Okay, you're going to get that lateral compression over the greater trochanters, and you can potentially do a lot more harm. So 
We did. We looked at our uh, patients at LA County, a two-year uh, two-year run of our patients, and we looked at all of our trauma patients with pelvic fractures, and we put them into different categories based on what their what their fracture pattern was, of who would potentially benefit from them. So this middle category are the ones that you you know those are probably the ones that are going to be helped by a binder, right? The open pubic symphysis. Nobody's going to argue about that, right? The open pubic symphysis. You're going to put that binder on, close it down. Those are the patients that are really going to have that decreased volume from this. Then we looked at the patients with these ileal fractures and acetabular fractures, femoral neck fracture, that could potentially displace the fracture further. Uh, and then also looked at the ones that are sort of uncertain effect, right? So sort of from classical teaching, ATLS teaching, all that, you would assume a lot of patients are really going to fall into that, definitely helped by binders. When we looked at our total patients, really only about 3% had that fracture pattern. And we looked even at our hypotensive group of patients, it was really about 6% had that fracture pattern. What we took away from this study is the importance of the pelvis x-ray. Um, I know it's going out of vogue uh, in general, uh, and I personally don't think it's necessary in a lot of patients, but if you have a hypotensive patient uh, or a patient that you're really worried about a pelvic fracture in that you're thinking about putting a binder on, if you have the opportunity and the time to do so, try to get that x-ray so you can see what your fracture pattern is so you make sure not to, to, not to incur more harm uh, than you otherwise could have. Also, when you look at the literature on pelvic binders, uh, it's actually interesting because it's something that we've been doing for years, and it's sort of one of those uh, kind of dogma things, right? Pelvic binders are sort of act like a tourniquet, basically, for the for the pelvis. <clears throat> and definitely, we know that the binders definitely reduce that volume, uh, but there are complications that occur, and the physiologic effectiveness, how much it actually decreases that retroperitoneal space, and how much it actually decreases the bleeding, Nobody's really ever showed that well in studies. So this is something that we do, and for certain fracture patterns, it's probably still a good idea, but it's important to keep these things in the back of our mind to know that there's really not a lot of good evidence to tell us that a binder actually does what we teach that it does, okay? We know that it decreases that volume of the pelvis, but does it actually make an out a difference in outcome uh, for the vast majority of patients that it's put on? Um, in general, most of the data says very little change in survival. So for binders in general, I'd say selective application definitely can be useful. It can help stabilize the fracture, help decrease pain, and in an open book fracture, definitely can help decrease the volume of the pelvis. But make sure you know that no good deed goes unpunished, okay? So that uh, even though it can be helpful in some, it can hurt others. So if you're able to, try to get a pelvic x-ray prior to placement. Uh, and you ideally don't want to put it in, in, in fracture patterns that can be further displaced by the binder. Second thing, preperitoneal packing. I'm sort of getting these two up front that um, have a lot of controversy surrounding them. Uh, but preperitoneal pelvic packing, uh, some people have that in their algorithm, some people don't. Uh, if you're going to do it, this is how you do it. You make a small incision uh, just below the umbilicus and above the pubic symphysis. You get down to the preperitoneal space. And the goal is that you're going to get those packs basically all the way around to the back. And those packs will, um, will help to decrease again Again, that space and create tamponade. So you, you really want to get all the way around to the back, which is extremely important uh, to to do because it's not uh, if you don't do it all the time, it's not always the easiest thing to do. So you really want to kind of dissect, get them all the way around to the back, uh, and create that tamponade effect on either side uh, of the pelvis. These are just some cadaver pictures showing you sort of how that looks. Um, opening up that preperitoneal space, you have the peritoneum there and the packs in place, and they really sort of tighten up, and then you close the fascia on top of it. So you're basically basically closing that in and those packs are taking up the space that blood would have otherwise taken up. Most of the data for this comes out of Denver Health, um, and they've shown that uh, definitely there's some decrease in blood transfusions associated with the patients that they do the, uh, the preperitoneal packing in. Um, and the, the thing that they really um, support is this idea of the patients that are unstable, uh, that you can potentially do this preperitoneal pelvic packing, and this can act as a transition, one of, one of sort of the tools in your kit for a hypotensive patient that you're working to get them to angiography, that this is something that can do, that will uh, buy you a little bit of extra time, uh, waiting for your angiographer to get set up or in the hospital or whatever. Um, one of the big things that, uh, again, the flip side of it that you have to keep in mind, severe pelvic fractures. This is a study that came out, a pelvic study, a prospective study, excuse me, on uh, pelvic fractures overall. And um, so 
not even severe pelvic fractures, all pelvic fractures, uh, there's a very high rate of associated intra-abdominal injuries as well. So if you've done this preperitoneal packing, it's important to remember you haven't actually gone into the abdomen to look for any injuries inside the abdomen. So the preperitoneal packing can potentially stabilize the patient, you can get them to angio, hopefully stop the bleeding in the pelvis, but you're not off the hook at the end of that. You still have about 20% of patients, maybe upwards to 25% of patients, that are going to have uh, some sort of intra-abdominal injury that might need to be addressed in some way. So it's important to remember that. This was a recent study that we had done also looking at the NTDB, so big, big database uh, study, but looking at these severe pelvic fractures um, and vascular injury, because these big named vascular injuries, you're not going to help those with a binder or a packing, right? Those are ones that you actually have to go in and operate on. And we looked at um, that in all of these patients that have these severe injuries, 10.7% uh, have big named vascular injury. This is iliac artery or vein injury, um, which is not going to stop unless you go into the abdomen. So it's a real number of patients have bleeding that's not going to be stopped simply by preperitoneal packing. And then uh, almost a third, or a, little more, a little bit more than a third of them have uh, severe intra-abdominal injury as well. So just important to keep that in mind if you're using that and it's an appropriately placed in your algorithm uh, that you do preperitoneal packing, just make sure you remember you're not done once you put the packing in and that patient is stable. They still could have bowel injury uh, or other injury that you have to address in the abdomen. Next, Reboa. I guess that's actually also still controversial as well. So, um, uh, so Reboa is another thing for pelvic fracture bleeding. Um, that's a, it's sort of an old technique that's been brought back in vogue in the last probably five, six years. is starting to gain a lot of, uh, gain a lot of steam and become significantly more popular. Uh, Reboa, probably most people know what it is, but in case you don't, it's a resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. So basically what you do is you put the balloon in through the groin, either side, through the uh, femoral artery, the common femoral artery. That balloon is fed up uh, through the aorta, and it can be uh, blown up and it basically occludes the aorta. It acts as an aortic clamp, but without the big incisions that we need to do to do an open uh, aortic clamp. So it's very, uh, it's very attractive as, uh, as a method of occluding the aorta that's a bit more minimally invasive. Sick patient, you don't open a whole other cavity in order to do it. Uh, and it's quick. It's very, very quick. You can do it in a couple minutes, no problem. So uh, the key to know for this, however, is that you're occluding the aorta. So when you have a big open belly and you have a clamp on the aorta, there's this big thing sticking out of the belly, right? So everybody knows that clamp is on and you see this ischemic bowel and you, you, you know that your clock is ticking. With a Reboa, you have this tiny little catheter now that's coming out of the groin and you have this stable blood pressure. So everybody's like, oh, okay, good. We're out of Dodge. We have a minute. We can, you know, go get a cup of coffee. Not really, but <laughs> you have a minute to sort of relax. And the key thing to remember is it is just as much stopping that bleeding as that big clamp on the aorta is doing, right? So, um, you know, it's, it, you can't stop. <laughs> you have to keep going. You know, you don't get this false sense of security now that your blood pressure is good. Um, you know, I had a case like fairly recently where I had this super hypotensive, horrible patient in the emergency room. And I mean, so clearly this patient is about to die. We got the Reboa in and I got up to the operating room and anesthesia as we roll in and I'm sweating. I'm, you know, we're like, okay, good. We got, we're here, you know, MTP, cut this, get that, you know, we're all hyped up and anesthesia is kind of like, whoa, everybody calm down. Like the blood pressure is fine, you know, and, and it's not their fault. Right. But we're just like, no, you don't understand. Right. You know, it's a, um, you know, because the, that, that balloon is in and you don't have a lot of time to, uh, you know, it buys you that time initially, but you don't have a lot of time. Right. So then we had to be like, no, 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 the Reboa is up. And they were like, oh, okay, you know, and so then they start, you know, resuscitating heavily. So it's important that you, that everybody knows what you're doing. Everybody knows that it's up. Everybody knows that the time that it went up and, uh, and that you have to sort of keep moving forward once it's up. Okay. Zones of occlusion. Sorry, I digress. Um, zone one, zone two, zone three, the aorta for the purposes of Reboa is divided into these three zones. Zone one is up in the chest above the level of the diaphragm. 
the the key of that is you put the balloon up up there and it's basically like doing a thoracotomy of cross clamped the aorta and uh, no blood flow below the level of the diaphragm. Um, so that's going to be good for any abdominal or pelvic bleeding. And if you don't know what's going on, your patient's about to die on you, that's a good place to blow up the balloon. Zone two is over the visceral vessels. Try not to do that if you cannot all avoid it. Zone three is down by the pelvis. So that's going to be below the level of the renals and before the aorta bifurcates into the iliac. That for pelvic trauma is your sweet spot. That's where you want it. And the nice thing about that is that your blood flow to the viscera is still going. You have a little bit more, now that I've said you have no time, you have a little bit more time when it's down there. You still have blood flow to your viscera, you still have blood flow to the kidneys, um, but this basically just will stop your blood flow to the pelvis and to the lower extremities. So you have a little bit more time if it's in zone three than you do if it's in zone one. A lot of evolving uh, indications for this. Um, there's a lot of things we don't know. It's a very um, uh, attractive technology. It's, uh, there's a lot of improvements that are being made in it, so it's being adopted by more and more people. Um, but it's important to remember what we don't know. Um, we don't know exactly the perfect patient to put it in. We don't know exactly how long is okay to keep that balloon up. Uh, I think we're pushing the envelope and uh, having some good results, but it's important uh, to keep track of these things and know that we don't really have good data to guide us in this quite yet. Uh, who should be placing this? Should it be done in the ER, in the operating room? Should it be done pre-hospital? There's definitely some robots for the military folks that are being placed uh, in uh, outside of any of the hospitals in the field, and there's some very good results that are coming out of that um, out of that experience. Uh, in Europe, uh, some of the pre-hospital providers are placing these. Before before patients get to the hospital, should be placed at a rural center and then transfer. There's all these questions uh, that people are, uh, are still talking about and trying to answer. Things that we think we know, um, better probably not to put it in if you have big bad bleeding in the chest or uh, the vessels above the chest. If you think about it, theoretically you put that balloon in, it's going to increase the pressure above and probably worsen your bleeding. Um, very promising results with pelvic bleeding and these new profile catheters, um, wireless, uh, smaller French sheaths, um, probably cause much less damage to the vessels and probably the outcomes are going to end up being a little bit better than with the larger uh, catheters we were previously using. Uh, important to remember the pitfalls of this. A great paper that came out uh, this past year that sort of divides all of the potential complications into categories. Um, and it's really good, I think, to think about it in this way um, because each step of it, you can have different complications, right? So your access issues, where you put the balloon, uh, how much you inflate the balloon, do you overinflate it, underinflate it, um, how you deal with it, and then how soon you take out the sheath. Um, this is something that is very near and dear to me. These sheaths, no matter how small these sheaths get, it's still a sheath in the common femoral artery and still has the chance of uh, creating complications of blood flow to the leg. And there is nothing worse than the idea of you've taken this patient that uh, should have died, now they haven't died, you've done this amazing thing to save their life, and now they lose their leg because they have this sheath in too long or they have a complication from that. So it's extremely important, and this is where I think uh, nurses and physicians together, uh, that collaboration is extremely important. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll get out of the operating room, and I'd like to think that we remember everything, but we very often don't and very much rely uh, on the nurses when we get there being like, what's this? Are you sure you want this in still? That sheath <laughs> that's in the groin. And it's extremely important that that sheath comes out as soon as possible uh, because these patients get hypercoagulable once you get them out of that initial uh, resuscitative time, and they can clot that off and have significant complications down the road. Uh, also, sort of, uh, these are just sort of some pictures to show a balloon up in the iliac artery. That gives me angina every time I see that picture. That's an actual patient. See how much that balloon is blown up, and the size of an iliac artery is small. Um, so big problems can happen with it, but there's very promising results, and, uh, and this is a really interesting and useful technology for some of these patients that are, uh, are very sick from this. Uh, angioembolization. Most people would agree that this is the goal. This is what you want to do. This is where you want to get your patient. Bad pelvic bleeding is so phenomenally treated in the, in the embolization suite, um, in the angio suite. 
Um, the, a lot of the bleeding is very deep, uh, deep down in the pelvis, very difficult to access, and uh, an angio is a great method of doing this. So it can be diagnostic and therapeutic, which is always good. Percutaneous access, relatively minimally invasive, and, uh, and it can, you can embolize at that same time, and you can really get excellent hemorrhage control. These are just some pictures of some really bad bleeding uh, coming, off the, uh, coming off the iliac and the pre-embolization and post-embolization pictures I and mean, it can be highly, highly effective for very uh, audible bleeding even sometimes. Uh, important little tidbit to remember, if you have a binder on in that, uh, in that patient and they go up for angio, a lot of times we'll just cut a little area so they can access the groin and go in, but it's important that you do a run at the end of it with the binder down. Uh, this was a patient that had a, a nice run, they're okay, no more bleeding with the binder in place, took the binder down and still had a lot of bleeders uh, as well. So important to take a look with the binder down. Um, if you're going to choose angioembolization, uh, get there quickly. Patients that uh, are going to get embolized do better if they get to em uh, if they get to embolization faster. Um, this is sort of one of those things in the orange book for verification that everybody knows about that 30 minutes to angio time, which everybody is like, ah, that's impossible to do. Um, but th I think the key element of that is time matters for this. Uh, getting them to embolization quickly is really helpful. So. Um, so don't sort of delay, get there as quickly as you can. Um, bring things with you. Uh, don't go empty handed, bring a little picnic basket uh, that includes blood <laughs> and resuscitation stuff and more stuff for IVs, uh, drugs, all sorts of things. Important to do that, right? Um, I think all of us now are getting used to having CT scanners closer to the emergency room. Um, you know, when I did my training, uh, our CT scan was in the basement at the other end of the hospital. So we all knew really well, don't take a road trip uh, with a patient to the CT scanner. CT scan is where people go to die. Now people, uh, you know, that's not as much the case, um, but angio, people can die in angio. <laughs> um, they're just not set up for a lot of, um, uh, a lot of sort of crashing patients. And, and many centers are more and more, but, um, but know what your resources are and definitely augment uh, as need be for your unstable patients. Last thing I want to talk about very quickly, bilateral internal iliac artery ligation. This is something that's not done very commonly. We started doing this a lot at, uh, not a lot, but it uh, sort of popularized at USC. Um, and it's definitely not for every patient. Um, I want to make it clear that this isn't something that we do for every single patient that comes in with a pelvic fracture, but this is for that patient that's hypotensive, very, very sick, uh, that is not going to wait for angio. Uh, they're crashing. They're probably going to arrest before angio gets there. You don't want to do a thoracotomy. You don't want to uh, have them arrest and do this massive transfusion while you're waiting the, I really hope, only 30 minutes for uh, embolization to start. Um, and so in this group of patients, one of the other options is you can take them to the operating room, explore that hematoma, and ligate the internal iliac arteries. You can do it temporarily. Uh, you do a temporary uh, ligation of the internal iliac arteries. Um, this is just sort of some dissection pictures. You take a vessel loop and double it around the internal iliac artery. Uh, big thing you want to make sure to do is not injure the ureter, which is going to cross over right there at the bifurcation. It's a nice way to see where you are. You know you're in the right spot, um, but obviously you don't want to injure it when you do that. And then the iliac vein sits right underneath. Uh, so when you're coming around, usually if there's a big hematoma, they're dissected separate uh, already for you. So you can almost just use your fingers uh, to get that, that vessel loop underneath. You don't have to do a lot of instrument um, dissection. And the importance of that is if you're using uh, instrument in not very good visualization, you have to be cognizant of that iliac vein because you can definitely make a bad situation even worse, which is sort of that tenant of trauma, right? Don't make an already bad situation worse. Don't sabotage yourself. Uh, the patient does that enough for you. Uh, so, um, so you ideally want to avoid that iliac vein, and then, uh, and you can get a vessel loop around the internal iliac arteries. And what we'll do is we'll take a vessel loop around, double it around, and then use clips uh, to do that. And what you can do is do a damage control, and then you can go to embo, uh, you can go to angio suite, and uh, you can just open up that that uh, the whatever sort of temporary abdominal closure you have, and take down that vessel loop so that your uh, your radiology colleague can get a wire passed and uh, embolize distally, and then you take it off, no problem. This is just a picture intraoperatively of somebody that had this done, internal iliac arteries, and, uh, and usually you can just take it off after, even if you end up keeping them on and they stabilize and you don't go to angio, the next day when you come back, you can just take that down and flow is usually restored.
With the internal iliac artery uh, ligation, you definitely need to pack as well. You need to do some pelvic packing run because usually that doesn't fully stop it. But usually between that and some packing, you're able to stop most, uh, m most uh, sort of uh, obnoxious bleeding. So key points, pelvic fracture bleeding, number one, hemorrhage control. That's gonna be your number one priority. Um, in an unstable patient, you've gotta do something to stop that patient from bleeding. So ideally, if you're gonna put on a binder, try to get a pelvis x-ray before you put that binder on. Um, the, that, that will potentially help you uh, in sort of your life of putting it on a lot of, a lot of pelvic fractures. Uh, Reboa is definitely something to consider as a bridge to definitive treatment. You put that Reboa up, that gives you time, that buys you time to get to the next place that you need to go to, whether it be the operating room or the angio suite. Uh, embolization is a key intervention. That is, uh, that is your goal. Um, in an ideal situation, you're able to embolize somebody and then deal with whatever intra-abdominal injuries they have or whatever other uh, other issues they've got going on. Unstable patients, however, belong in the operating room. That doesn't change just because it's a pelvic fracture. Unstable patients with hemorrhage belong in the operating room. Uh, and then it's important to remember high rate of associated uh, intra-abdominal injuries uh, associated with, with especially severe pelvic fractures in patients with hypotension. You want to make sure not to forget about that. That's it. Thank you.